Martin, thank you so much for being here. So I'll be very brief. It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Patrice Lockhart. She is the medical director of an interdisciplinary interprofessional team at Sweetser. It is the New England Eating Disorders Program, and she's here to talk with us today about a problem that I bet affects every single person in this room in one way or another. So please welcome Dr. Lockhart. Can you hear me? I don't like mics, so if, I, if you can't hear me, tell me, but otherwise I'll probably be waving this thing around. Um, absolutely true intro. Every single one of us has some relationship with a disordered way of being with food. You may love food and think, oh, I shouldn't love it so much. You may think you should hate certain kinds of food so you don't eat them. You may have a loved one who has dealt with an eating disorder and you don't know what to do. Um, you may have thought that you're more important on the outside than you are on the inside. And so all of these illnesses start culturally. Um, and then they become medical. So it's a really short bridge from something that is thought about constantly to something that becomes very quickly uh, destabilizing to the body. And that's where we all are going to come together today, is on that bridge. Um, I didn't start talking about treating eating disorders in a weight-biased world until about 10 years ago. And I was a shy uh, rebel at that time. I didn't really, I didn't want to get into it too much. And I realized I didn't want to get into it too much because for the first time in my life, I started having body image issues. Never had. Menopause came along. Became my worst enemy. All of a sudden, I was not all that uh, easy going about kayaking in a sports bra. I had to think, I thought, about, well, what do you wear to a professional event so you look appropriate? And it started to um, affect my single-minded focus on my patient's well-being. And then I started to see that my, uh, my medical colleagues were already putting that second to what some rules were about size, weight, shape, and exercise. And suddenly I started seeing that body mass index was the top priority of some people's uh, appointments with their medical provider, rather than their function or their physical well-being. So when the, the tipping point was recognized in me, I realized that I had a very strong responsibility to not only look at my own biases, which I didn't like very much. Face it, we don't like our biases, you know? But if we don't see them or recognize them for what they are, we can't change them. So that really is the first step for all of us is to see, where, well, where am I not quite neutral? and to start from there and to start looking at those things. And what would it take to balance out that neutrality that's kind of off kilter. It's almost like a, an adjustment of the spine. You know, if you can't really lean to the left as far as you'd like to, we've got to start looking at what's going on on all sides. So this is just the beginning. Um, I could talk to you all day without this thing. I probably will trip on a cord here once or twice, but I'm going to do my best. Do you want me to change this for you? No, that's okay. Thank you. I think I'd have a harder time adjusting. Um, so treating uh, eating disorders in a weight biased world. Here's some common assumptions I want you guys to look at and stick up a hand if you think it's mostly true. Overweight people die sooner than leaner people. One, two, come on, be honest. Okay, probably a few more than that. Being overweight puts people at significant health risk. Okay, more. Uh, anybody who's determined can lose weight and keep it off. Ooh, that corner thinks you can, all right. Weight loss will prolong life. Okay. Um, the only way for overweight people to improve their health is to lose weight. I kind of gave you an only, didn't there? Uh, and there is a serious obesity epidemic in this country. Okay, people are willing to jump on that wagon. All right, we're going to come back to those a little bit later. Something that you people probably know, especially the social work side, is that sometimes people hold on to a core belief that's very strong. And when they're presented with evidence that works against that belief, no matter what it is, new evidence can't be accepted. 
it would create a feeling that's extremely uncomfortable called cognitive dissonance. And because it's so important to protect a core belief, a person will rationalize, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with that core belief. Anybody got examples of a core belief they just don't want to let go of? Mine was me in a sports bra. I didn't want to let go. I want, didn't want to let go that it wasn't good enough. Anybody got an example? Nobody's got a core belief that they're not willing to give up. Yeah. Southern Maine is full of rich people. Very, very powerful. Give me another one. Okay, we'll go with that. Southern Maine is full of very, very rich people. Is there anything that is more important to you than that belief? What are you willing to challenge it with? You moved here anyway. Okay, so did you move down here because you thought then you would suddenly become one of those rich people? <laughs> I know, I know. What was your motivation? Um, education. education. I, can, I can learn despite my belief. So that's a really big thing. You're well on your way for get, of getting that thing out of your way. And as, again, a lot of people on the social work side of the room, and maybe not so much on the pharmacy and the OT and PT and medical side, it is, um, it's not only possible, it's imperative that we learn that skill of being able to change our thoughts or being able to tolerate not believing everything we think. So once again, this is, I don't know, I'm kind of sneaking all this in because I want every one of you to be able to take care of your patients and be able to see things from their side more than your own so that you can be of use to them. That's more important than any kind of training you've got. You can memorize drugs, you can memorize procedures, you can face your own insecurities, but until you're able to see somebody from a point of view that you don't have, you're not gonna be able to do them any good. Okay, we're gonna work on that. One of the most powerful uh, core beliefs that was pre-geography uh, was that the world was flat. So the world was flat to the human brain. It wasn't that people thought it was, it's that that was their only experience. And so it took a lot of changing uh, perceptions and a lot of education for that to become a, an old-fashioned idea. Our culture has chosen a thin ideal for this part of our journey in uh, time. Fortunately, this ideal is changeable. Here's where it came from. Well, we're gonna go forward a little bit. This is what things looked like in the uh, late 20s and 30s. So we had a Great Depression in this country. We had a couple of world wars that we were in between. Uh, things were very lean. And so the, the ideal at that time was more is better. People were more educated. They had more flesh on their bones. They could eat better. They knew how to get food. So they were idealized. And the advertising took on this uh, really great concept of the, the economy of dissatisfaction. You get people to spend money on things that they don't have. So at that time, they didn't have a lot of, of excess. And so there was no excuse for being skinny. We can get you to add weight. Weight on. Don't let them call you skinny. Look at this greedy guy in the bell bottoms. I love that. Skinny girls. Girls with skinny figures are amazed at this entirely new way to add five pounds of solid flesh. And that was as legit as fat people, oh no. And then we started reducing your flesh in specific areas. And then we hit the 60s. And boy, didn't they go to a very idealized uh, picture of a slender person. So starting since the 60s, we haven't changed back in really significant ways because this country continues to have a whole lot. And we don't want to really be perceived as more. We want to be perceived as less, at least in our phys physical size. So why are more of us fast? Are fast. Hmm. We're, we are fast, too. But why are more of us considered fat? Well, the myths are we eat too much junk food. We don't get out and play enough. It's our genes. The reality is not only this thing I'm going to read to you, but one reality is we are taller and we are heavier people. Um, and we live longer. 
So I want you to put those three things together. That's not going to match up with this, the things that, you know, being overweight shortens your life. Actually, being in a weight range that is supportive of all your organ functions is higher rather than lower. So you're at greater risk of premature death if you're at a low weight. Yikes. That's going to mess up with a lot of people's thinking. This quote is kind of funny. And who, I'm, I'm going to read this, but I want you to know, uh, if, see if anybody knows what this is referring to. A 19th century astronomer, a 20th century insurance actuary, and a handful of scientists concocted what a normal weight should be, and they called it BMI, Body Mass Index. So I'm going to tell you what some of those things. That's what we just talked about. Adolf Kedele was the guy that started this all. He wanted to find out what the ideal or normal man would look like. So he took measurements of the normal man's arm bones. He studied what age the normal man got married. And he decided on a measurement of weight to height. He made it up. It's, this was also a class study of white males, white adult males. So we got a pretty small category that, of measurement. And he went from for kilograms over metered squared, which is kind of fun, pounds over inches times 2 times 703, if you really want to go after that one. Um, it lay dormant for decades. And then a researcher in um, not only obesity, but in restoring weight to patients who had been starved in World War II wanted to estimate the average body fat percent of a large group of white adult males. But he added the variable of having diverse builds. So he didn't just want a certain kind of build like Cadele did with the ideal man. He wanted to see what people of different bone structures and genetics would look like. But he was very careful to say, this is never to be meant for individuals, and never to be meant for women or children, and never meant to be for, used for ethnic diversity. So we named it the Body Mass Index, or An Ansel Keys did. It was easy. It was easy to remember. Um, and then the National Institute of Health decided, well, if it's easy to remember, then that's something we could use. We're going to call this, we're going to put these um, BMI numbers into ranges, and we're going to link it to obesity. So we're going to have normal, and we're going to have overweight, and we're going to have obese, and we're going to have extremely obese. And we're going to, oh, we're going to have underweight too, but not really. So the arbitrary uh, threshold was set for at 27.8 for men and 27.3 for women. There really is no rationale for that, except then it still wasn't easy enough to remember, so it was equalized for men and women and children all together. And suddenly, we've got millions of people who were obese overnight because those numbers were changed. We didn't change. Tom Brady's obese by these categories. So we have to be really cognizant, and when we become, as some of us are, professionals that people depend on, you better know that this is basically meaningless information. Because now, insurance companies have taken on this NIH uh, stipulation and make money off of it. So you now get paid for restricting yourself into a body mass index range for your insurance coverage. You are required to be weighed when you go for any medical appointment. This gets kind of scary, because they're using it against us. So I'm, I'm, I'm preaching a little bit to the choir, but not yet, because medical training has also bought into this body mass index um, ease. Of course we do. It's easy to remember, and we got to remember a lot of stuff. But this is one I really want you to start questioning. And by the way, that cognitive dissonance thing, I don't expect you guys to jump off of the train you've been on for a long, long time and onto my train that you're getting to hear an hour and change worth today. 
what I will hope is that you're just going to expand your awareness a little bit and question some of the things that you hold very tightly. Uh, okay. So the other part of this is the money making part. Funding for the National Institute of Health and CDC, they get funding for, from, um, for obesity research from companies that have products to sell to people who are obese. So there's funding from pharmaceutical companies with weight loss pills. We have now Vyvanse that is approved for binge eating disorder. It's a stimulant. It's not addressing the binge eating disorder. But you can make money off of it. The funding is also coming from companies that, that um, create the uh, tools for bariatric surgery. So this is a lot of difficult material to decide, wait a minute, well, where's, the, where's the patient's function and well-being in all of this? And we're going to get to some of that in a minute. Okay. Bottom line is it's hard to find anybody that is in the field of obesity research that doesn't have some type of financial tie. Even, I hate to say it, well, I don't hate to say it because I've talked to the directors about this, but the 5210 program that's in schools are being funded by, by obesity researchers and they can't undo those ties. So this is the importance of lobbying and money is it really is power. You know, to lose funding for some things that are so important, like let's go, let's get moving, let's get kids interested in physical activity is now linked to, has to be linked to let's avoid obesity, which is completely different. Uh, yeah, so these percentages are pretty amazing. Now, 40% of adult men, 30% of adult women are considered overweight or obese with a, a BMI of over 30. And more than half are in a level one category. It was not that way before these numbers changed. All right, so the uh, life, are we talking about that? Mm -hmm. This is one of the best studies that I uh, hang on to because it's so large. And it came out um, in 2013 by a CDC researcher, uh, Catherine Flagel, huge study. Uh, millions of people, 2.88 million people from 11 different countries. And it was funny, the press that was uh, received for this study was a really big splash early and then downplayed later. Because again, the CDC had to choose between supporting one of their own researchers with some dead solid data versus losing money. So they played the, played the edge on that one, did get it out, but didn't continue to support it. Um, these are the conclusions. Level one obesity, and we have to go with this BMI because that's the ranges that they studied, is not associated with increased mortality over normal weight, which is now considered a BMI of 20 to 24. Overweight, 25 to 29, is associated with significantly lower mortality. Overweight lower than normal, or what's considered overweight, is lower than what's considered normal. Underweight has the highest risk of premature death. Obesity levels of the second and third degree do have increased mortality risk, but they're still lower than underweight. So this is the picture. Based on body mass index, the mortality risk is highest on the left-hand side. It goes down, we've got a pretty nice dip with the lowest being that 25 to 29, which is overweight. And then it goes back up, just like a good bell curve will, but it's still lower than the risk that is uh, for the lowest weight population. The bottom graph is how we believe things should be. That we should worry the least about the people that are the lowest weight, and that our concern should increase gradually and quite a bit more for the people that are at low risk, going steadily upwards. So we're putting a lot of people at risk with our beliefs rather than what the reality is. And still we diet, and there's our picture of France Fanon. So what are we doing? What are we doing as providers? We're actually recommending or tacitly supporting things that are dangerous to our patients. Thyroid enhancers? People are really savvy. They're going to come after you 
saying, I know I'm low thyroid. And you may not know it yet, but you will pretty soon that thyroid um, is variable depending on all sorts of things, nutrition, stress, uh, medications. So getting a thyroid result, any, even a thyroid panel is not going to give you a very clear picture. But if someone is saying, oh, yeah, 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 I'm really sluggish, I'm sleeping too much, they're more likely to talk you into uh, having some thyroid replacement. Same with insulin, actually, is one of the most manipulated drugs to have weight alterations. Uh, patients with eating disorders who are type 1 diabetics are 90 percent sure to, ch to mess with their ins insulin to protect their weight. So you really need to be aware of that, uh, using insulin in, in that way. Liquid protein diets, methamphetamines, bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is the only general surgical procedure for which people are allowed to advertise. You're not going to see a general surgeon say, let me take out your gallbladder. Even an appendix, which really has no function. It's not, oh, we should really just get rid of that. Now, this is not to say that there are not people who, to ben who benefit from bariatric surgery. There are. But the range of people that are being advertised to with the, the claims that it's going to be positive for them is much, much too large. And we have to be very careful who we recommend the surgery for. Not only are they going to have psychiatric illnesses based on bariatric surgery, they're going to have an eating disorder from the get-go. They will never have a normal relationship with food again. And for some people, that's not as important as the health benefits that they will gain. But for the vast majority, that is a curse that they don't need. By the way, the um, patients are being recruited to for bypass surgery as young as 14 now. You don't even have an ac accurately functioning frontal lobe by 14. Okay, I'm going to shake all that off. Anybody got questions at this point? Yes. Well, I think it goes back to the, the alarming part of that is it's the only surgery that is, is um, being done to change a perfectly functioning organ. So people don't really get advertised to for getting rid of, you know, even, uh, even for Crohn's disease, it's not, come and get your colon resected. You know, you don't do that until it's, it's damaged. So with bariatric surgery, you're, you're working on a healthy, fun healthy functioning stomach, which I think is not great. Anyway. Um, that's a, actually a very good point. Um, well, elective, but for cosmetic reasons. So there are plastic surgeries that are not, are not considered uh, necessary surgeries, and then there are. So I think at least that's a little bit more honest and direct, um, because you would not, it's, it's a real slippery slope when somebody says, I'm going to get bariatric surgery because I'm too fat. But that's what's advertised. And also, the prevention of obesity is concerning because it's not fixing something that's broken. So I get very concerned about um, having young people educated to how to have a healthy lifestyle. They've already got a healthy lifestyle. If they're outside playing and eating whatever they want and everything functions, they're great. They don't need to be taught how to worry about their weight. But that's actually what we're seeing more and more. I have, I'm, I think six was the young, is the youngest so far that I've been asked to assess for an eating disorder. Because it's very easy to latch on to something that says, eat this to be healthy, move like this to be healthy. And so, okay, I'm going to do those things. Heck, I had an eight-year-old who would swing for six hours a day because he wanted to make sure he didn't become an obese child. No prior problem. So we created that thinking. But I'm going to think more on that plastic surgery. Yes? Oh, fat and all that kind of stuff. <sighs> it's really iffy. There's, there's a lot of, uh, for one thing, the measurement of body fat is, has got to be very, very specific, and it's usually not. 
so that the people that are measuring have not, you know, encompassed the areas of body fat that are important. So I guess the thing that I would look to for body composition is uh, the research that was done on the biggest losers. So with this massive amount of weight loss and amount of body fat loss, it was unsustainable, even at the caloric loss that they had when they finished the show and were quote unquote, quote unquote successful. They had to reduce those calories another third in order not to regain the weight. And you can't do that. <laughs> you can't sustain, you know, it's hard enough to sustain what they were on was a 1,200 calorie diet. 1,300 calories a day, by the way, is the World Health Organization um, starvation level. So go below that and then cut it again to 800. It's, not, it's just not going to happen, which is the reason that 98% of diets fail. So 2% two per, two of people who, who go on diets keep that weight off for more than two years. This is also true for diabetics. The initial uh, weight loss for someone with uh, first type 1 diabetes is going to be significant, but it only is significant for six months. So the long-term effects are what we're really looking at. Other questions? Am I making anybody sad? <laughs> <laughs> yes? I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I feel like there's been a shift a little bit away from TMI to more body, um, to more ideal body weight. A little bit. As, as a marker for treatment levels of care. So I'm wondering, I don't know, how does that play into all of this? Well, I, I appreciate that just for the unsettling of something that had become settled. Yeah. The real important research is, and, and there's so much more of it, is that physical activity is what's going to make changes. So, uh, and function. So I think if we can get those two things established more, and, and they are more, you know, 30 minutes of activity a day, is being, oh yeah, 30 to 45 minutes of activity a day, you're gonna increase your function, regardless of weight. So that would be the direction I would hope things would go. Anybody else? All right, you wanna hear more about eating disorder treatment? Because that's what I do all day. Yes. That's a great question, because there's so many factors that lead to an eating disorder. I don't often care why someone presents with one. That's something that we can look at once they are medically stable, at a functional weight, back to things that they love doing, and then, yeah, let's, let's see if there's still some traumatic results, which there very often are. So that is, I would say trauma is maybe, oh, if I had to rank it, right up there with the cultural norm. And then there are things like, oh, I love ballet, or I'm a wrestler, or my mother talks about diets all the time, or you know, just uh, the things that are less uh, specific. So we have a wide scattering, but those two, the cultural ones and the trauma history, are very, very uh, prominent in diagnosis. But you can't treat trauma until you're nourished, because the brain's gotta be really really functioning. Okay, I'm inching towards my thing here. Okay, oh, 2017, I gotta fix that. Okay, so binge eating disorder is the fastest growing diagnosis. Part of that is because we now have it uh, in the DSM-5, which is great. It's no longer in that wastebasket of eating disorder not otherwise specified, and we can really treat it. I love this because we, um, Binge eating disorder is the most compassionate treatment we have. Uh, it really starts with neutralizing judgments, uh, not just about food, but about self. So it's informed our treatment of all of the other eating disorders as well, and with great effect. Um, some of these facts are that not all large size people have binge eating disorder. Not all people with binge eating disorder are larger size. And anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa can be diagnosed at any weight especially now that the DSM-5 is out and they've taken out the percentages of uh, deficit that were required before. It's kind of fun because I um, 
have gotten to know one of the physicians, psychiatrists that's been on the panels for DSM-4 and DSM-5, and he's like, ah, we struggled with that 15%. We really didn't mean that to be absolute. We thought that was a useful guide, and then we kicked ourselves because we couldn't get away from the number. People love numbers too much. Um, this is interesting, though, because as treaters who are going to run into someone for the first time, we have to be careful what we say. It, oh, you lost 20 pounds? Oh, great, you're in a normal range now. Well, not normal for that person, you know? They had a significant weight loss in a, in a short period of time. And there was a lot of thinking about, I wasn't good enough at that weight, even though I was high functioning. We see it a lot in high school and college athletes. I just want to get my times down. And then, you know, it's the, the bridge, again, to function uh, loss is very short. So suddenly, they had that initial euphoria, which we do get. There is a rush to losing weight initially, whether it's after the flu or from a diet or from increasing your activity. But it quickly turns into uh, cognitive deficits that keep you stuck in it. Uh, okay, so criteria back to binge eating disorder. Once a week for three months, I don't know. This is not gonna help you all that much. Anyway, the treatment for binge eating disorder, uh, intuitive eating is the goal, it's the, it's the buzz vocabulary for binge eating disorder. Um, a great book by Judith Matz and Ellen Frankel, if anybody's interested, and a diet survivor's handbook. Uh, so when you're talking about being in, in control, we, we turn that to in charge rather than in control, because we're not in control of a whole heck of a lot in our lives, but we can be in charge of what uh, is available to us. Um, already told you that. Parents are really important these days. 20 years ago, we didn't include parents or family members, spouses or siblings in eating disorder treatment. We just pulled people out of their environments, fed them, tried to teach them some coping skills, and then put them back into an environment that supported an eating disorder in some fashion. So we are much more, um, I don't know, savvy about that. And we find that our patients who have family members that they're willing to include or friends that they're willing to include, most often the barrier to treatment is they just don't want to ask somebody. They might have a whole slew of people who would say, yeah, I could do that. Um, but it's just hard to get past that asking place, which most of us have. Um, I want you to have this phone number in case you need it at any time. If you would honor me by putting in your phone, go for it. If not, you can find us on the Sweetser website. Um, this number can get you directly to me if you're concerned about yourself or you're concerned about somebody else that you know. I'm happy to answer your questions at any point. And it's, uh, it's just not been a problem. I've been, at the, I've been working this way for about 15 years and I, I am not over inundated. Every call has been very useful. So, here we go with some uh, internal judgment uh, core values. In calling people fat, in calling fat people gluttonous and lazy, we're ascribing moral characteristics to what is largely a biological phenomenon. What do you think about that? If we're judging people with Negative, yes. Come on down. <laughs> when we comment on other people's weight and may call someone else overweight, we're actually also having that judgment of ourselves and we're now using um, kind of like how we measure other people's weight on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so also if someone we're close to says, well, that person's really fat, we then use that judgment of what they see. Exactly, so mm -hmm. um, I guess just think about that. Yeah. Um, so I think that like, you're saying that it's like a largely a biological phenomenon. I guess the largely part is like, it's not, like there is, like there are other factors at play than the biological, is that what you're saying? Or other phenomenon besides people being gluttonous and lazy. 
Right, but like there's a whole society involved mm -hmm. that beyond like the biological. I was just wondering why it, like that was the one that was used predominantly to yeah. like, like it's largely biological, but like it's also sociological. Mm -hmm. Well, those would be in that ring of things beyond biology. That um, biology is the most uh, non-judgmental. I guess that would be. And I didn't write that quote, but that would make sense to me. That we, if we go back to biology and what our cells are meant to do, we're going to be less likely to be judgmental. Does that make sense? No, that's okay. That's okay. I don't know. When I see the word gluttonous or lazy, it makes me go ooh. Does that affect anybody else that way? Or to think of the other things that we attribute to body size that have nothing to do with body size? You know, I, I'm lazy. I like to go home and read a book. I like to be in bed on the weekends. So what? So it, it's an opposite action thing of coming to terms with some of these uh, words that, um, again, can help us with with bigger changes beyond even just eating disorders. Anybody else have thoughts about that <coughs> gluttonous and lazy quote? You do? Just that I, I had um, read something about it's one of the m more common forms of discrimination now um, in this society is, um, I, I believe I was reading a study about um, applicants to college and um, when the applicants, you know, were not seen, they were accepted. And then when they came for the interviews, the the obese people were not chosen, and the you know so-called normal weight people were. And so, um, yeah, it's a form of discrimination. I think that we don't often think about. It does happen very young. It is the highest form of bullying for school-age kids now. I've also definitely seen this in a clinical context, um, especially for people who have certain um, diagnoses like heart disease or diabetes with co-occurring obesity. It's very common to hear clinicians at all levels kind of make side comments about, you know, sort of suggesting that they might have done this to themselves. And um, the Barca lounger. Yeah, you and know it's. It lives in the Barca lounger. That's why. Right, and it's hard to believe that that doesn't have an effect on patient care, the quality of care people are giving. So just that awareness, again, of um, what you say matters. Um, hello. Hi. Um, the other thing that I'm really drawn to, too, is that any time that we place stigma on biological phenomenon, and especially if someone comes into a medical setting, or even if they come into a clinical setting for mental health stuff, that we end up being completely blind to real issues. Because we think the only thing that's presenting is that, oh, this person is overweight. Mm -hmm. And so, and these are the things that it means about their personality and their character. And if they started doing exercise, everything would get better for them. Um, and so it creates huge blind spots for us as health professionals. Yep. Yay! <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else want to preach it? Because you're going to have to practice this. You're going to have to get I, really good at it. I guess I'm going to say, I'll be here. Yeah. Um, I was sort of thinking about that thought too. I work a lot with um, males with eating disorders, mm -hmm. and um, you know, all the research and just my my experience has been that they have ex a lot of stigma. They've been bullied about their weight, um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why they don't come to treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so I just I just think that's an important piece to put out there too. Is the stigma <clears throat> and the societal pressures actually prevent people from acknowledging it's a problem? Yes. Uh, and then therefore don't you know go to seek treatment. The other thing I would say, too, is there's lots of literature out there about um, medical providers and providers in general misdiagnosing men, mm -hmm. um, you know, with eating disorders, binge eating disorders specifically. Oh, it's okay. He's just having a pizza all by himself. Mm -hmm. He's a guy, you know, it's a Sunday afternoon. I don't know, right? Each person is different, but um, it's just something that I think is quite interesting. Yep. Yep. Thank you. And by all the pharmacists. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah. We got a question. How hard is this for you guys to absorb? Are you in, I mean, are you already thinking about these things? Yes. Okay. What would help you? Because you gotta feel isolated sometimes. I do. It's really hard. I, I mean, again, for me, I came to medicine late. I was a musician first and I got my MD at 40 
And so I was like new for a long time. And here all of a sudden I had to become an expert in my chosen field. And I was expecting my peers to know more and get it more. And then I'd hear, oh, it's got to be in my little, and I would go, mm, but I wouldn't say anything. So I've had to train myself to say something. Well, I appreciate that that is your marker, but I'm wondering if you know what that's based on. And do you have any other things besides body mass index that can actually be useful? Because that's, that's not telling me a whole lot. So really, the education has to come from your mouths to everybody's ears more often than you're going to want to, because <laughs> this is just one of those things. And it's, you know, it is a discrimination. We, we've got a responsibility to deal with these things. OK, somebody had a question back there. One. Oh, thank you. Um, I, what would be helpful, I think, is how to navigate those conversations with our patients mm -hmm. when we first see you know, someone that is possibly on the going towards an eating disorder or mm -hmm. maybe has already self-diagnosed himself with that and kind of first steps in like how to talk to them about what is wrong and what is right with the BMI and all of those sorts of yep. things in a very easy to understand kind of non-confrontational low barrier way. What would you do? <laughs> what would you say if you had somebody and the mom goes, ooh, I don't know, eating's gotten kind of weird. He goes up to his room for dinner when he used to eat with us. Uh, I'm, I'm finding out that lunchbox comes home full. I'd probably ask, I mean, what, what's changed or why or what have you, I mean, if I'm talking to the mother, mm. then um, what's, what's not normal about that, I guess, and what do you constitute as normal? Uh -huh. um, if I'm talking with the kid, just trying to get an understanding if it was such a drastic change, like what has been going on? Uh -huh. What happened in the last month or two? or you know, to kind of spark that conversation realization maybe for the mother too of something happened and yep. that's the response. Yep, so great instincts. Okay. And some other sort of neutral things might be, uh, tell me what you eat in a day. Uh, do you like your body? If not, what are you doing to change it? Are there things that you do if you feel like you've eaten too much? What are they? Have you ever, and then being really specific, have you ever used diuretics, diet pills, laxatives, ever thrown up on purpose? So that it just gets real clear that you're comfortable with the language in a non judgmental way so that, that the identified person can actually get over their cringe to talk to you. But don't ever discount a parent, I'll tell you. Parents miss a lot or they. They put up with a lot. They may normalize a person's weight loss or change in, you know, relationship with food, but they knew it really early. So if someone had confirmed that that was potentially a problem, usually they get to me and they go, oh, I, I knew it, I knew it, but I didn't do anything about it. So that's, that's really where you guys can be the key. Yeah. Depends on the, what the conversation is. The thing that changes for adults is they get to decide if it's a problem or not. Kids don't really get to decide. We have to keep kids safe. So that, that makes it really easy for me. Boy, sometimes when somebody's 17.9 years old, ooh, it gets really hard. Because you, know, you really need to respect their emerging adulthood and educate them at the same time. Sometimes it's helpful if they are dependent on family members still for you know, a house and a room and food, you can start to go, well, you know, you haven't quite crossed that independence place, so what are your, what's your family worried about? And they may or may not be honest, so that's the other, other thing. I, I always expect people with eating disorders to not tell the whole truth because they can't tell the whole truth. They just don't have that capacity. Their, their cognitive ability is limited. And so I don't judge them for not telling the truth. I'm like, I can't, I can't know if this is it, but from what you're telling me, this is what I hear. And then we can go from there. Very good question. Yeah. I think what one thing I really want to learn more about is just the little things that we, well, not little, because they are, have a big effect, but the things that we do and say uh, every day that kind of perpetuates this. Um, 
like the stigma against either un being underweight or overweight, just even making positive comments about someone's right. body image. Right. You like can say, oh, you look experience. great, you yeah. lost weight. Yeah. And you don't know that maybe that person hasn't eaten for a couple of days and you're like, oh. So, and also, uh, I would like to learn how maybe to talk to uh, medical providers and doctors, maybe when they um, are working either with one of our clients or working with us personally, if. Um, maybe something they say just doesn't add up. I guess from my own personal experience, what I felt is that one time I lost um, quite a bit of weight and my doctor noticed that and I was like, yeah, I tried to explain how it wasn't necessarily in the healthiest way I was going through a lot and she goes, well, you're still, your BMI is healthy so I wouldn't worry about how you Boom. lost the End weight. end of conversation. So. Um, you gave such great openings too. Yeah. So. It wasn't quite the healthiest way. Yeah, that maybe all you get. So. Those two things of what, what I kind of do on a personal basis that may, maybe perpetuates that and then also how I can talk to providers both for myself and so for So what would you say? Clients. I'm that provider. Okay. Well, no, your BMI is great. So um, maybe that don't, that I'm really the only person that really understands my experience and that my body size or weight doesn't really tell the story of what's happening on the inside. Well, what's the story? Um, well, for every person it's different. So. What's your story? For me? I mean, I'm just saying, I'm, <laughs> yeah. the, I'm the kind of obtuse uh, yeah. medical professional right now. What do you mean? Yeah. You're fine. So just going through stuff in your life that's stressful and um, for, I guess for her, I guess what I felt is that they, it just wants to be quick. They just yep. want to get you in and out and there's right. not enough time. So unless it's a really serious issue that you feel like is going to take like immediate control of you, then there's not, you don't really need to focus right. on it. Right. And that is the culture of, of treatment these days that's the unfortunate part if i were not an obtuse physician i would say woo that sounds really important let's make an appointment just for this yeah and i would say well you sound like you're a little bit worried about your weight loss let's set up appointments at least just for weight checks once a week and make sure that it stays on track because i don't want you to get into a danger zone yeah. right now you're you know your vitals are fine right now i might do a little bit of lab work it might not show anything but i want to make sure that you don't get lost in my mind yeah. with a problem that is affecting you. Mm -hmm. And that's all it really takes. You know, just n don't shut down a conversation. And when you're talking about as a social worker, right? Social yes. work yep. on the way. Um, oh, not taking, <laughs> you're gonna learn to nuance so that people don't feel shamed for being in a profession that doesn't allow them to be shamed successfully. I mean, you know, medicine's the worst. You gotta either know what you're talking about at all times or pretend that you do. But it does take social work and all other disciplines to go, we are colleagues and I think I might have some information you don't have. Would you like it? You know, that's not too threatening. They may not have time, they may not want to, and you still can say, I, I'm, I'm going to send this to you, so you'll have it in your record. So it's advocating for more interprofessional yeah. teams. And stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah, because boy, does it take a team, and all parts of the team are irreplaceable. That's the thing. You can't, you can't be the one to say, "Woo, your blood pressure is too low," but you can be the one to say, "This is really affecting my patient in these ways." Yes. Hi. Um, one thing I've heard a lot um, about is um, when women are pregnant and mm -hmm. getting comments from. Um, their nurses saying they're either gaining too much oh, yeah, weight or yeah, yeah. not enough weight um, and then after the baby is born as well so I was wondering um, how often you get cases like that from um, women who are pregnant or have just um, given birth recently plenty more and more and again part of its cultural with magazines of who lost look at this after baby body blah, 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 blah. But yeah, we have a lot of people that come in just to restore weight so that their baby will be okay. And then they may get lost to treatment and they may come back. I guess and one of those points that I'd like to make is that it's never the last treatment episode. So when someone is ready, they're gonna make some progress. And then they need to go out and practice. And then they can come back. And that can be to you or to me. It doesn't really matter. So. Um, Alongside of that, I like to set real boundaries for readiness. So if someone's not making progress, that you don't pretend that you're doing eating disorder treatment with them. You might be doing motivational enhancement to get ready for it, but make it clear. Because a lot of people will come in and say, oh, I love my therapist. 
have you made progress in these behaviors? Well, no, not really. We lurked together for seven years. And like, that's not eating disorder <laughs> treatment. You know, that's, that's getting ready. Yes, over there. I'm going to take the one in the chair first. You want a microphone? Um, I just wanted to sort of add on to what Christine said earlier about um, talking specifically about an adolescent who presents with an eating disorder. And just um, one of the things that I would advocate for is, is talking to the parents and see what is their conversation mm -hmm. like to their kids about their own weight. And um, I can speak from personal experience that that is a very impactful thing. And so, yeah, asking... What's the, how, how does your family talk about food and how do you talk about weight in that, in that context? Very important part of the puzzle. And I also wanted to just ask you um, <laughs> if you know if there's um, education in Maine going on in schools around eating disorders. We're trying. Um, I'd love more help. <laughs> so if anybody would like to do some of that work, I think, you know, and this may be something that's a project for you or your followers in, uh, you know, most of you know that Kendra's doing a, a year-long placement with us, and I, I fully hope for her to take the reins in doing some of this volunteer work with the education she now has, and I hope others would join. Um, you know, we're... we're <laughs> I love doing this outreach because I think it's as important as the treatments that I start, but I can only be one person. So I'd rather have, if you have an interest in doing that, talk some more. Okay. So, so it's not something that's really done much? Then. Oh, gosh, no. Not nearly as much as health class obesity prevention. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Question? Oh, it's just more a comment. Comment. Um, well, I was just going to say on top of kind of all, this, all of this, these good points that are being made, I've lived in a lot of places in the world too, and I think that it's really important to educate people on like not just the cognitive dissonance that he was talking about, but like the cultural dissonance too. That like it's very specific to our culture in America to have the pendulum swing and to be in multiple areas beyond just eating disorders there's a lot of extreme wealth and extreme poverty, you know, overeating and undereating. And there's this, there's not really a sense of like kind of the Eastern practice of balance in a general sense. And eating is just one of those, like trying to not make, when you approach eating disorders, trying to not signal it out as like one problem that one person is have or that a group of people are having, but as one problem of a much bigger set of problems which is just a lack of balance in our culture and trying to approach it from that because then when you go and you look at other cultural standards or you look at all the other cultural advertisements even or like just putting away your phone or putting away your computer or trying to watch less TV, you start to try to get more balance in the fact that you're not immersing yourself into a cultural bias. So sometimes that kind of more like well rounds out the issue. because. When I think you see a lot of times people with eating disorders aren't just, they're not just swinging in, in a dietary sense. A lot of times you'll find that they have, I don't know about your experience, but you'll find that they have these extremes in other parts of their lives as well. Or like parents who think very, very differently, like just something that's very not, not balanced or structured. I would say it is a, it is a wide uh, range of things that are broadly, again, that's why we don't have good data on what causes an eating disorder, because you're right, there's so many factors that come into play that are not merely about that one issue. Hi, so I just had a quick question about scales. You know, so often patients are concerned about how much they weigh, and I know during the recovery process, you know, providers will weigh their patients just to make sure they're, you know, stable how um what's your type of like rhetoric around scales in patients using them um, thanks initially if they are letting a, an appliance tell them if they're good or bad like we joke about it it's like oh it's like well what's your toaster say and 
numbers more than even a scale or the appliance can be the thing that trip people up. So we have apps for how fast can you go and how many reps can you do and what's the time for this and that and the other thing. Numbers tend to derail a, a flexible cognitive process. So we often will encourage people to, well, maybe you should put that away for a while, like you would put your phone away for a while, get rid of the apps, and let's see if you can tolerate not knowing. So that balance of not knowing what your future is, not looking at what your past was, a lot of mindfulness training, a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, training goes into uh, flexibility. So, and I know that a lot of docs forget to weigh people backwards, and that can be a, an immediate setback, or it can be immediate conversation. Like, ah, no, you know? That even determines the degree of motivation on the, the patient side. You have to have a lot if you're gonna um, have a behavioral change that institutes a life. Yes? Uh-huh. Um, facility with uh, teenage boys? Substance abuse, he said. Yeah. Um, and so I've seen with, through the use of different meds for antidepressants mm -hmm. or antipsychotics, really big weight swings. Mm -hmm. And a, a reaction of that is um, some of the drugs not having the eff intended effect because along with them come this stigma around the weight gain. Mm -hmm. So I've seen like a 30 or 40. So non-compliance. Right. Yep. Um, and I wonder if you've seen that. Oh gosh, yes. It is so tricky. It's so tricky when you're trying to balance um, several issues at once and some of the treatments affect the quality of life in different ways. It's really, really hard. And I think you have to constantly talk about it, you know? So what would this side effect mean to you? Not only about a number, but in your life, you know? Because if you're getting <laughs> picked on for a weight gain that is helping your bipolar disorder, yeah, that is not fun. And there's not a great answer. So it's really working on how do you handle stuff that's not gonna go the way you want it to necessarily in every way, and figuring out the priorities for which, which is doable right now. Because everybody's got different thresholds, you know, for tolerance. Yeah. It's just a hard, hard question. Yeah. There's not a, not a good answer. I feel like in the 90s, it was like the, the Giselle body type where you're tall and athletic and thin, and now it's that like Kim Kardashian body type where your waist is tiny and you have a big butt and hips. And I'm noticing people are trying to gain weight, but only in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like that's something you've come across? Does that qualify as an eating disorder? Like when you, especially if you're using something like a waist trainer which can be so unhealthy and you're trying to gain weight but only in certain parts of your bodies and make other parts really tiny. This is why it's complicated. It's, it's just complications, you know. Um, I think people get bored too when things are going really well and you don't have any projects and you don't have anything you have, you know, a drama you gotta fix. It's hard to get used to things being okay. And so, you, I, I, I do see it all the time, you know, that variety of, of swings. Things can be copycat stuff. It can be a, a culture of your classmates or colleagues. I don't know. I, I try to have just a tolerance for humans having that way of thinking. And then when it's a problem for them, they're going to figure out which way they want to go or need to go. And, and it, it won't be up to me to tell them that this is a problem. I mean, I don't even like telling somebody, you know, it's bad for your liver. I mean, they know it's bad for their liver. People know think when they're overweight. You know, this is, in terms of the weight thing, when is it appropriate to talk about your weight? Never. When should you, as a parent, say something to your kid about their weight? Never. Because if it's positive, that's all they're going to think about. And if it's negative, that's all they're already thinking about. So that would be the cultural shift I would love to see. It's not about what, how much you weigh, it's not about what you look like. Let's go for the other internal priorities. Yes? I was just wondering um, what your thought was around, uh, there's, I feel like I'm hearing two different separate things, like you have the actual eating disorder and what that looks like, mm -hmm. and then you have like a body dysphoria, or like a, or not dysphoria, but like 
dysmorphia is that what it is okay or like um or i hate myself and i don't yeah, deserve I hate, yeah i hate like a like a body shaming t- type of thing and yep. those are they're separate like they're concepts separate but connected. they're connected yep. and with when we're talking about so um eating disorders and that's like what we're talking about um it's inescapable that we talk about like body shame and so is it useful to narrow in so closely on eating disorders or should we like frame it more in the sense of like okay body shaming body image issues body you know is that like the new like a a direction that's worth going in oh they're all worth going in (laughs) and i think it depends on your own comfort and your uh ability and willingness to gauge the comfort of the person that you're talking to because if it's not something that's talkable you can say anything and it won't get through but if it's something a person is able to hear or understands that you just want to connect with where they are then you're going to get more information so all of these things are truths at the same time so like an eating disorder is sometimes easier to understand or like to to broach the subject of for some people okay Interesting. For some people who are broaching it and for some people who are, are suffering from it. Yeah. Yeah. I just started specific and then go broad because, again, I don't even know if you guys, what you're ready for. So if I throw out as many things as possible and we find some things that really intrigue you, then that's where I want to go. Yes. And just to kind of throw a wrench in that question is uh, I've been seeing a lot more clients with ARFID. Oh, it's just good um, talk. About the OT folks with our yeah, um, it's avoiding uh, avoid avoid restrictive. restrictive food in well, food uh, intake. It's very long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't keep it all straight. You guys but, know about Arford yet? Um, yeah. yeah, I just I was curious if you're seeing clients, um, you know, with Arford and and how you guys are treating them because it is a really different treatment. Yes, it um, is. And there's really no information on what works. <laughs> um, well, I, well, not I, a lot. I should. I say, find but. OT works a lot which has been just great in terms of texture, uh, preferences and difficulties, phobia, specific phobias, mechanics. I, I'm still uh, delighted at how many times a mechanical problem will be identified from somebody who does that well. And we can catch this much, much earlier than, than we could before. But you're right, the treatment's very, very different in terms of uh, you know, expanding food choices and the other thing is, for some kids, they can be functional until puberty hits. And I've had, a, had kids survive on Cheetos and yogurt from age 0 to 12. And they're out doing all their stuff. And then all of a sudden, they fall off their growth curve because, well, they need more. And so that's when it gets to be addressed, which is the OT table. I've <laughs> okay. um, when it gets to be addressed. But it, again, that's, it's kind of fun to learn about a different... Um, Subculture in the. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's happening? And it's like, yeah, okay, now we got to address it. We didn't have to before. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? You guys have such good questions. Yes. I have two questions. Really quick, what is ARFID? Avoidant restrictive feeding and intake disorder. DSM-5, newbie. And is it prevalent mostly adolescents? Um, it often starts in young childhood and then becomes problematic with adolescents later. Or adults, you know, we might find somebody's had ARFID forever and it just never was identified. Correlated with autism. Textural sensorial, is- sens- sensorial issues. It's sensory, either in texture or uh, fear of vomiting, having seen somebody vomit, having vomited themselves, and then, I'm not going towards that food, and then things get narrower um, with the associations with that fear. It can be soft. A lot of times it's just crunchy things. You know, the texture stuff is very, very important. Like if we see somebody with anorexia nervosa, they're avoiding carbs and fats. And we see somebody with ARFID and they want the cheeseburger and they want their chips and they want it only in this range. And that's all they're going to do. But, you know, give, give it the right kind of food and they can start to expand the volume and the variety. Yes. 
So I have a question about, and I don't quite know how to phrase this. It seems in our culture, a movement over the last decade has been looking at food allergy mm -hmm. and looking at things that are good for you, bad for you, mm -hmm. like a lot of, you know, not eating milk products or dairy products or gluten or salt or sugar or there, there seems to be more being sort of promoted that to take out of your diet, whether you have food allergy or not. And sort of looking at sort of an adult, older population, it seems to me there's a proliferation of people who become obsessed mm -hmm. with what they eat, how they eat, when they eat. Um, and I'm wondering if you're seeing that in practice, that it's, it's changing from what, what seems to be a very healthy a positive way of, of thinking about food. Hate that word healthy. Well, whatever, <laughs> you know. It's taken on a bad name, unfortunately. It has taken on a bad name, I agree. Um, because it's great to identify foods that people may actually be allergic to mm -hmm. that will, like yep. people with celiac, who then feel much better right. and that it changes their life in really positive ways. But it seems ubiquitous. And so I'm wondering in older or adult populations, if you're seeing people who are now developing disorders around these. Yes. And I'm seeing people who um, become less tolerant, especially of gluten, the less they eat of it. So it's kind of this cyclic thing that's, uh, it's too bad, you know, because the body adapts and then can't really adjust again. So I mean, you know, I'm old school. <laughs> Let your kids play in the dirt and eat whatever they want. Um, because it increases the immune system's capacity to be flexible. So, but it's, you know, again, there's the marketing side of that. So it's like this multiple truth thing. Uh, there's a lot of gluten-free stuff out there that sells really well. And, and some of it's really improved the life of people who have gluten intolerance because stuff doesn't taste like cardboard anymore. But at the same time, it has increased the number of people who start gluten-free and then they go narrower and narrower and then they get malnourished and then they have an eating disorder. So, you know, these things have a chain, chain effect. Anybody else? Are we running out of time? I don't even know. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. Oh, great. So, you had a question? Yeah, so I guess I, I was sharing a story that when I was early in my career as a PA, I worked in a family practice, and I had a doc I worked with who'd been working 30 years, and um, I had a young girl who I was, you know, I was pretty convinced she had an eating disorder, so I asked him, where can I refer her? And he said, well, I don't know. I've never had anyone with an eating disorder. And he'd been in practice for 30 years. So um, I guess my question is, as we go, you know, move away from Portland, move away maybe from cities with um, places where we can refer, where would, you know, what type of professions would we look to help um, these folks that we may see? <laughs> All of you. Um, it still is, you know, five to seven percent of the population. So we're not talking everybody's got an eating disorder. So it could be that somebody in 30 years of practice might have missed five or ten. I don't know. Some more, some less. Um, that being said, the risk factors are, are so much greater than they used to be. So you're, you've got a higher percentage of population that's close to that edge of danger than ever. So that, that merits more um, just awareness and paying attention and not ignoring the questions, not ignoring, again, your own biases towards size. Does that make sense? Yeah. More males all the time. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of equalizing in a way. <laughs> that It's not just the females that are having the body image distortions to the point that they will uh, seek treatment. I, I, again, that's good and bad. Um, like everything. I got some other stuff. You guys know about health at every size? It's kind of a, uh, the new peace movement, I think, in terms of medicine. Da -da -da -da. Oh yeah, look at all those percentages. 69% of people uh, get fat shamed by their physicians. I think that's just atrocious. Okay, so yeah, and that was in a study of one out of three ne responded negatively to obesity of 400 physicians in a study. And the, all these harsh words that make me cringe again, noncompliance, hostility, dishonest, poor hygiene, lazy, no self-control, 
dumb, weak-willed, sloppy, and dishonest. That's a lot of the judgment words that we have with fat. And now, in some cultures, it's kind of getting to where people are going to fat as the neutral world. Just call me fat, you know? Don't call me all these other things. I'm, I'm larger size. That's just that. 63% um, more likely to be bullied, according to the Internal Gen International Journal of Pediatrics, and are singled out for interventions at school. Ugh. Stand up if you weigh more than 100 pounds. We've, I've actually seen this in third grade classes, you know? It's just, the stigma is just really crazy. So then all of a sudden we've got more depressed, anxious kids with low self-esteem and more binge eating because they're trying to restrict their eating all day long and then they just can't stand it because their bodies need more. Uh, just what you said. Doctors also spend less time with overweight patients. That's a cringer and are less likely to perform preventative health screenings or do interventions. Yikes. Uh, yeah, the equipment's a big deal. If you have anybody that comes to you and says, well, they tried to take my blood pressure, but they didn't have a cuff big enough, that's, that's almost like a social service call, in my estimation. Call that office and make sure they've got the right equipment for all of their patients, not just the ones that are smaller sized. That's a big deal. I uh, went backwards. What can we do? All these things. Small changes in physical activity or nutrition. If you really think somebody needs to do something. Empathy without the blaming. Provide the same treatment you would for a smaller sized patient, please. And recognize when you don't. Uh, Non-judgmental language. This is the real fun part about intuitive eating. Is uh, you get rid of right, wrong, good, bad and all of its fancier neighbors, uh, healthy being one, healthy, non-healthy. Oreos, ah, we love Oreos in treatment. <laughs> it's just variety and it's enjoyable. Um, but that really, you know, and we were talking about the different kinds of foods being labeled good and bad. You actually have the luxury to do that unless you have an eating disorder. And then you don't have that luxury anymore. You know, you just really can't afford to talk about things in good, bad terms because it makes you sick. Now, the rest of us, we shouldn't be able to afford it, but we tend to, tend to glide along. So I, I'm going to say that my life is so much better when I stopped judging things good, bad. So I can't afford it either, even though I don't have an eating disorder. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I got to be flexible with my thinking about people who still do that. So that's, that's my judgment pattern. Look at your own stuff. Look at the way your judgment matches. Trust your own internal signals of hunger and fullness and fatigue. That's a really big one. Um, when people lose connection with their hunger signals in their body or their fullness or when they're tired or when they're, you know, rested enough, then they start not being able to discern safety. So I think that's a really big one. And our patients, I, might, I, mean, we, I, I make them eat when they're not hungry because they've lost their hunger cues and that's not a signal for them anymore. Can't, we can't really treat the binge eating side of things until we get those hunger cues back in place. So if someone is being a restrictive eater and then also binging, we wanna normalize a pattern that their body can get used to before we start working on the binge eating part. Health at every size, here it is, okay. Yeah, they're really great at looking at the conflicts of interest in research and um, looking at things that, that prioritize profit over health. Um, intuitive eating, after all, how can you truly nourish something you hate? Ooh, that's a good one. So the, the uh, mm, yeah, we talked about this, but these are just the, uh, put the numbers and the names to the, the stuff about retaining improvements after weight loss. Takeaway message, not only do we lack proof that being fat causes us to contract most major illnesses, but we do not have any evidence that losing weight makes us any healthier. J. Eric Oliver, here's another good one. Based on our current evidence, blaming obesity for heart disease, cancer, or other ailments is like blaming smelly clothes, yellow teeth, or bad breath for lung cancer instead of cigarettes. Right? Don't judge the outward. Go for the inward. Uh, 
okay, so there's, here's these common assumptions. Any shifts in any of these from ooh, where you were before? Overweight people die sooner than leaner people. Any shifts at all from where you were? Yeah, one shift, okay. Overweight people are at significant health risk. Any change? Okay, a couple changes. If you, can, if you want to lose weight, you can keep it off. Any change in your thoughts about that? How effective are diets? How much? 2% of diets work. It's the most prescribed thing that there is. Oh my God. Yeah. Who else would prescribe something that's only 2% effective? Uh, and serious obesity epidemic. We didn't really talk about that, did we? We kind of extrapolated. Well, my extrapolation is the change in the BMI numbers are what caused the numbers of obese people to rise. So in that way, yes, there's an epidemic of numbers. There's not an epide epidemic and change of function. Does that make sense? And yet, we still diet. That's that, folks. Thank you for your time. More questions? More sunshine? Up to you. Well, thank you so much. Oh, there's another quick. Go for it. No, there's still so many questions of, you know, even the HDL, LDL relationship is, is a little bit murkier these days, so it's tricky. Anybody else? Yeah. Microphone. Um, I'm really interested in, like, um, the difference between healthy food like I know like you want to encourage that nothing is off limits but I just I still find that like that's my one that's like my core belief that's causing my cognitive dissonance dissonance right like that some things are healthier than others and like uh, the obvious choice is to eat the healthier things can you define healthy uh no okay. so that might help you <laughs> But I can define unhealthy, but that's like... Well, so you can't define unhealthy, you can't define healthy. Why not? Because it's a not to something you don't know. <coughs> Do you think maybe your um, perception of what is unhealthy is kind of stigmatized? Or culturally I'm not sure created. I understand. Yeah, or culturally created. I mean, like... But I think it relies on science, which I think is like, uh, or tries to be above culture. I would say look at healthy before you, and, and just put your unhealthy thoughts, thought about unhealthy, just a little bit to the side, and go after something that makes you a little uncomfortable. Because that's probably going to be new information. If you're comfortable already, you're not going to learn anything new because it feels okay. But I just, I don't know what I would have to gain from from like looking elsewhere. Right. You don't have any idea of what you've learned. <laughs> right? That's good. And you don't have to learn anything else if you don't want to. Yeah. I'm just, but, I'm just wondering. but that process of discomfort with new things, we all have that. And that's when we know we're learning something to expand our current knowledge. Yeah. And if we don't want to learn anything new, okay. We'll stay within the parameters of what we are right now. Um, one thing I've learned in my education, like a, as a way to frame things that are healthy, is that it really depends on who you are and what your conditions are. Like, if I'm severely underweight and like have this whole like orthorex orthorexic thing with Oreos, then maybe eating Oreos can be really good for me mentally and physically and regaining that weight. Um, another example I can think of is that we always hear that like lean proteins are really good and like having a high protein diet is great. But if you're in kidney failure, that might be really, really bad for you. So like healthy really depends on where you are in your illness and just where you are medically in general so and mentally. So expand the, the realm of healthy. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Thoughts? It's such a great question. This is the core, you know? It really is of what we struggle with. Yeah? Well, going off of that too, um, like I can think of, for example, soda and framing it. At, like if you are working with a child that's drinking soda, a bunch of soda with dinner or something, you can say that's going to affect your, or that could affect your sleep because obviously sugar keeps you awake. Like that's um, something I, yeah, that's something I use for um, kids that I work with that might be having like sleep issues or. And, and in a different realm with a, an anorexic child, a caloric beverage is what we got to get in mm -hmm. on. And we'll take those sugars however we can until we get to a different range. So it's, I, I, I like the flexibility of ex what you all are bringing into this. It just gives it more room to expand on, on your willingness to think broadly. Cool. Great. Oops. So given all the money that's going into obesity research, <laughs> I would. Um, I asked you a question about resistance earlier to hearing this information and hearing this data. But there's an extraordinary amount of money out there funding obesity yep. research. So I'm. I'm just curious for you to comment on that a little bit. It's a really strong. <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> it's a really strong lobby. I mean, money talks and money influences. So just being aware of it is going to help you with your bias, and that's you know, that's the best I can do. I'm kind of a micro. I'm a one-on-one -on -one person, but I know there are people who are macro people that do policy and do all sorts of things, and I just hope they are as passionate as I am about the one-to-one -one, um, issues. Yep. Just on that, on that thought, there, I think there was a recent article that was published about how much money is, uh, f how much research on eating disorders is um, funded, like by the government, <laughs> uh, comparing it to like Alzheimer's and sort of other, um, uh, you know, uh, public health problems, right? Um, so you could probably look it up and Google it, and it would, it's a nice graph. I can't remember who authored it, but um, it's fairly recent. It would be either CDC or NIH yeah. funding. Yep. All right, shall we all thank yeah. Dr. Lockhart?